we are delighted that we get to put an exclamation point on what has been truly uh, an incredible weekend where not only have we celebrated Dr. Henson, we've honored and celebrated Bill Johnson, we've uh, enjoyed reunion and homecoming, and now we get to hear a good word from Dr. Henson's daughter, Elizabeth Henson Hasty. She is a professor of theology at Bellarmine University, although she tells me she is really enjoying her sabbatical right now. And a minister of word and sacrament in the Presbyterian Church USA. She is currently on sabbatical and working on a book project on God's healing in the context of families affected by serious mental illness. Her most recent book, The Problem of Wealth, A Christian Response to a Culture of Affluence, is being used in just faith study groups across the nation. Among other awards and honors, Elizabeth has distinguished herself with a Catholic Press Association 2018 First Place Award for a book related to Catholic social teaching, an award of excellence for, Bible, for a Bible resource from the Associated Church Press, serving as a Fulbright Scholar in Hungary, the Wilson Wyatt Faculty Fellowship for Excellence in Teaching, a Kentucky Anna Metroversity Award for Instructional Development. She has served churches in various capacities and particularly enjoys advocacy work in ecumenical interfaith dialogue. In addition to her scholarly work, she and her husband Lee, who is seated to my right, are the parents of two children their son is a student at Case Western Reserve Garrison, and their daughter Ella is in middle school. They enjoy being recognized as proud parents of a sailing enthusiast and a Scotties field hockey player. You must go to Highland Middle School, Ella. As well as being walked by their dog. Dr. Henson, hasty. It's a pleasure to have you in this pulpit particularly on this occasion. Please come and read our scripture lesson. Let us stand for our reading of our scripture lesson today. I want to first say a word of thanks uh, for holding the Henson family in your hearts as a congregation, and particularly to Bill Johnson, who was ever present when my dad was having surgery and also during my mother's death. I'm, I'm so, so grateful. May we pray before we read our scripture passage. Great source of love, ground of being. Draw us closely together in this community, in this moment, in this time, in this place. And instill within us your great imagination as we read these words. Amen. Our reading from the Christian scriptures this morning is from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. Now listen for a word from God as it comes to us through the hand of Paul. I was given a thorn in my body because of the outstanding revelations I've received so that I wouldn't be conceited. It's a messenger sent from Satan to torment me so that I wouldn't be conceited. I pleaded with the master teacher three times for it to leave me alone. The master teacher said to me, my grace is sufficient for you because power is made perfect in weakness. So I'll gladly spend my time bragging about my weakness so that Christ's power can rest on me. Therefore, I'm all right with weaknesses, insults, disasters, harassments, and stressful situations for the sake of Christ because when I am weak, I am strong. The grass withers and the flower fades, but these words of the Holy One endure forever. Please be seated. As parents, I think we often want to believe that our words, just as much as our actions, shape our children. No one could accuse my father, Glenn Henson, of being a man of few words. 
I have read some of the books and other published works that many of his students engaged with far greater depth, but I have lived with him many more of the lines of his impressive list of publications. I chose a passage to reflect on this morning from Paul's letters to the Corinthian community of faith for several reasons. Most importantly, it was the text for a sermon that Dad preached when I was a little girl. The sermon that stayed with me. I remember several details from the first time I heard you, Dad, preach from this part of Paul's letters to the Corinthians. I was probably about seven years old at the time. I remember having to sit in one of the front, if not the front, pews of the church. I knew, knew that meant I couldn't lie down in the pew during the service. And I had to sit quietly, swinging my feet back and forth, back and forth, looking at the scuffs on my black patent leather shoes. Fortunately, my stuffed friend, Sweet Doggy, accompanied me as a companion. My imagination could travel anywhere with her, no matter how long you preached. I also remember your double-knit light blue suit with the wide lapel. If I'm not mistaken, this may have been one of the times that you used as a sermon illustration my longing to acquire the two-story Barbie townhouse with a yellow frilly elevator and matching pink, blue, purple, and orange furniture. This may be a good time to interrupt my comments this morning with an important service announcement for all the preachers in the room. It's always best to ask if it's okay to include stories about your children in your sermon illustrations or in your classroom illustrations, as I heard from some of your students this weekend. They also may grow up, preach, and share stories about you of their own. <laughs> in all seriousness, at that time, you were wondering when I was going to realize that I had enough toys. Therefore, the title and refrain of your sermon on this passage stayed with me. God's grace is good enough for me. Does anyone else here remember that sermon? Grace is a familiar theme in Dad's writings. In your autobiography, you define grace as learning about the way God enters into ordinary human life. At bottom, it means gift. God's grace is unmerited, unearned, and up for us to freely receive. Most of all, I remember you giving testimony in your sermon about your hearing loss as a thorn in your flesh, which was an experience more new to you at that time. You were working out in your mind what it meant for God's grace to be good enough in the midst of realizing physical limitations, hardship, and challenging circumstances. God's grace is good enough for me. Not an easy sentence to speak or refrain to live and then to swallow, particularly in our society, where the I and the me always come before the we, and in the church embattled by fundamentalism with which you had to contend throughout your professional career. Paul's reflections in this letter are key for us to conclude this weekend's events. Paul's writings are one subject of Dad's scholarly pursuit, and Paul's voice spoke to and through the personal attacks that he experienced as a leader during the formation of early communities of faith. Paul resisted the impulse of others bent on creating division, and he spoke out, up, and into an ancient society that was constructed by imperialism and bolstered by military force. Now, I'll be honest with you this morning that I have a love-hate relationship with Paul. Religious leaders all too often use his writings as rhetorical weapons to enforce control and to stigmatize and subjugate the bodies of women, LBGTQIA people, and to divide people by race, ethnicity, and nation. For example, you may have heard some comments recently made by Robert Jeffress, the pastor of First Baptist Church in Dally, Dallas, who cherry-picked quotes from the Gospels and Paul's writings to mount his own defense 
of President Trump's command to build a multi-billion dollar border wall along the U.S. southern border. In his mind, walls are neither moral nor immoral. God is not against walls. Walls keep the strong strong. Drawing upon Romans, Jeffress suggests that every person should be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. There is far better news for us today. In the detailed work of many scholars who are recovering authentic interpretations of Paul's writings and his understanding of, of God's authority. Paul's writings point beyond the constrained and constricted concept of God's grace that's represented in Jeffress's comments. Biblical scholars today focus in on the importance of Paul's Jewishness for his identity as a colonized apostle and read him in light of his own experiences of having a thorn in his body. Paul's Corinthian correspondence is rife with references to disability, weakness, madness, foolishness, and insanity when compared to his other letters. Amos Young, a professor of theology and mission, suggests that Paul is the first theologian to write intentionally out of his experience of living with a disability. Paul uses in this passage the Greek word skolops to describe a, being given a thorn in his body because of the outstanding revelations that he had received from God. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 is the only place that scolops appears in the Christian scriptures. Many theories have emerged to explain the thorn that Paul describes. No one knows exactly what it was. There are hints in the Corinthian letters that Paul had eye trouble, something that disfigured his face and made him hard to look at. There's evidence elsewhere that he had epilepsy. Emotional trauma is also a, a plausible interpretation of the thorn in Paul's flesh. Biblical scholars agree that Paul wrestled with a great deal of hardship. Whatever the ailment was, it bothered him immensely. He prayed earnestly to be rid of it. Now, I don't think it is of great consequence to our interpretation of this passage this morning to understand what the specific nature of Paul's ailment was. It's far more significant for us to consider what his physical differences represented within his culture. Physiognomy was a pseudoscience used in the ancient world as a means to explain differences in human physical traits and aimed to discern how a person's appearance revealed their inner moral qualities. You probably know the phrase, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. There was this sense in the ancient world that you could tell one's personal character by their outward appearance, physical beauty, and their strength. The problem for Paul was who held the power and the privilege to determine and to identify beauty and good moral character. Ancient Romans valued harmony and balance as it was defined within the households of social elites and by the pater familias, the male head of the household. Social elites often use images of physical deformity or people living in poverty to represent disorder within the city and to underscore how their lives contrasted those disordered behaviors. Throughout the Roman Empire, it became fashionable for the wealthy to display people who were known as human curiosities in their homes as visual public reminders of the contrast between their understanding of well-ordered and disordered life. Hunchbacks, dwarves, obese women, all highly sought after to put on display and to employ as singers and entertainers. Moreover, physical marks were believed to ascribe social deviance and to signify individual moral failures. One's appearance in this sense could be thought of as a menace or a curse in the broader society. During economic downturns and times of social unrest, 
people with mental illness or physical deformities, as well as foreigners and ethnic minorities, along with other marginal groups, became scapegoats for social problems. One impulse was to turn away the weak so the strong would remain strong. The super apostles, Paul's opponents, used the invective of physiognomy against him. They honed in on his perceived physical limitations to underscore how threatening was his speech. For they say his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak. Therefore, his speech is contemptible. This attitude of the super apostles betrays a whole range of prejudices through which people were judged and sized up to how they matched Rome's elite and their view of the ideal body and form. In the face of the super apostles' insults, we really can't blame Paul in this passage for first raising questions about why he personally had to have this thorn in his flesh. That's a very human thing to do. Wouldn't it be easier just to figure out a way to look like one fits in, to try to go on unnoticed, just to pray it away, and not to challenge the status quo too much? But Paul, I think, realizes here that there is something that is far greater at stake. He doesn't allow himself to language with the more individual question, why me? Why do I have to live with this thorn in my flesh? He draws upon his experience of thorns and his belief in Jesus Christ, the master challenger of ancient stereotypes, the one who embodied generosity and hospitality to the most vulnerable, the stranger, and the estranged. Paul believed that the good news for his time was to radically relocate and reconceive of the whole notion of God's grace for and within a society that built itself up by exclusion. Exclusion of the different, the dwarf, the hunchback, women, slaves, all those whose identities were reduced to a trait perceived as undesirable and undeserving. Biblical scholars point out that within the larger body of Paul's letters, charis, the Greek term used here and translated as grace, refers to Paul's understanding of the experience of God among people and the planet Earth. Charis can be translated in many different ways throughout the Corinthian letters as grace, generous undertaking, generous act, thanks to God, blessing. Paul's response to the thorn that his ad adversaries so, mercilessly, so mercilessly point out is this, so I'll gladly spend my time bragging about my weakness so that Christ's power can rest in me. When Paul claims that Christ's power rests in his weakness, he is directly challenging and resisting the dominant hierarchical scale upon which people in his culture judged and valued different bodies. God's grace, God's generous act, upends social hierarchies, allies itself with those classed weak, and overturns systems and structures of domination that subjugate, divide, and exclude. Therein lies the good, good news. God's grace is good enough, expansive enough for all of us. It took me a long time to begin to see the way in which God enters into ordinary human life. One of the most memorable early moments was when we were living in Ruslikon, Switzerland in 1991. Dad tells this story in his autobiography about the divestment of the Foreign Mission Board of the Southern Baptist Convention from Rushlikan Baptist Theological Seminary because he was teaching there and the grace that he experienced from the students and also the faculty. I have an additional recollection that I would like to add about that time. 
I was the same age as many of the students studying at Rish Lakan, and they welcomed me as one of their own, even though I was from the U.S. I was there to travel and trying to figure out where my life was headed. Many of the students lived on the top floor of the house, which was also the main classroom and administrative building of the seminary. During the evenings, we often gathered together and we made dinner. We shared food and time. You wouldn't feel from the spirit of that place the tensions that were being felt all across Europe and the seismic change that was underway in 1991. I can only briefly highlight a few aspects of this era. We were in Switzerland not too long after the revolutions of 1989 and that resulted in the destruction of the Berlin Wall. Many formerly communist countries were left in a state of flux and change. 1991 was also the year that was leading up to the Bosnian War. Yugoslavia was never a part of the USSR, but built relationships with both East and West. After World War II, Tito, the leader there, emerged as the chief architect of a socialist federation that was known as the Second Yugoslavia. Tito defied Soviet control, and he backed independent roads to socialism. Under Tito, there was a great deal of work that was done to balance respect for all of the ethnic groups that were living in the nation. He died in 1980. Yugoslavia then experienced a state of economic decline. It led to a great deal of tension. During this same era, the US and Britain introduced the global economy to turbo capitalism. And the US cemented its position as the primary force driving the global economy, the strongest among the superpowers. Within this larger context, the first elections were held in Yugoslavia. Attitudes of social superiority among different ethnic groups emerged. They were seeking a scapegoat for their economic problems. Bosniaks, Muslims, were expelled from many Serbo-Croatian territories. Throughout the 1990s, you may remember that the term ethnic cleansing was used widely to describe the genocide of Muslims. A few weeks after we arrived in Rishlikan, we felt some of the reverberations of what was going on on the European continent, though I couldn't have named it in the same way as I've done this morning. Darko, a young Serbian man, he was a refugee who was fleeing the tensions in his native country, and he arrived quietly in our community to seek safe haven. No one hesitated to welcome him. They just provided him a room. Students with very little money added a potato to the pot or boiled some extra pasta. No one even discussed it. I learned later, since then, that Darko is a common South Serbian name derived from a Slavic root that means gift. Darko interrupted the narrative. He could have easily been seen as a burden, as a thorn. But Rushlikan embraced his weakness, and in that, the community showed and discovered its strength. The response of that community to the threat of war to waves of tremendous change, to the advancement of turbo capitalism and to fundamentalism could have been to ignore, to exclude, to focus in on their own individual needs. No one would have blamed them. Instead, people there created space for God's grace to break through. That gift of grace that is good enough expansive enough for all of us. You know, Dad, I never got the Barbie townhouse. I got the Barbie camper instead. I guess you were trying to communicate that I needed to stay on the move. I bet that all of you know and can name the many thorns that we have in our body today. Physiognomy may no longer be a popular pseudoscience, but it wears the disguise of different names. Physical appearance 
all too often still determines who holds the power, the privilege, and the status in our society and around the world. None of us can deny that we are in the midst of another moment where we're desperately in need of seeing and moving beyond constrained notions of who owns this household and constricted interpretations of God's grace. The culture of the United States, no matter where you live, will not let this concept of a grace that is good enough for all of us, a grace that finds its strength and weakness, to be easily understood. The great social mystic and co-founder of the Church of Fellowship for All Peoples, Howard Thurman, described living in U.S. society as living under siege. Thurman's aim was to sustain himself within authentic community despite the ravages that were inflicted upon him by society, to prevent the springs of his inner being from being polluted by the bitter waters that flow as drainage from the tablelands of violence and hatred. Incivility, the threat of war, militarism, racism, sexism, homophobia, and competition constantly surround us. It's easy to become numb. It's easy to focus on our own individual need and to ignore the damage that this culture of chaos inflicts upon our inner being and the way it fragments our communities. Paul urges us not to succumb to that, but to dig deep, to get to the root, to discover God's affirmation of us and claim upon us. If you believe with me that God's grace is good enough for all of us, then what potato are you going to add to the pot? What type of pasta are you going to bring to a boil, boil to feed the many people of God's household who are living under siege? How are you going to challenge a turbo capitalist system that creates other people's needs just to make itself look better? How can we together partner with God in imagining and realizing this household of grace, a place and a space where we're all affirmed for our creation in God's image and have enough? There is good, good news for us today. We can interrupt the narrative. We have strength in our weakness. We can be the gift of being open to and vulnerable to others. We can challenge ourselves to live as God's generous undertaking. I think that Dad would say, we can't stay safe in this house. Our call is to get out on the move. For the love of God, may that be our aim. Amen.